All right. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, I know this is some of you have been here all day and you're probably tired, but uh, I want you to stick around for what promises to be a very good dynamic panel. I've had a chance to meet our panelists and I'm really looking forward to what they have to say. My name is Guy Ziv. I'm a professor in the School of International Service. And um, I want to also thank uh, all of you for coming and the Center for Israel Studies, in particular, uh, Dr. Michael Brenner and Laura Cutler, uh, the director and managing director of the center uh, for organizing uh, this event. It was fun working with them and uh, my colleagues, Dan Arbell and others who are here. So, uh, and I dragged my students here. So hopefully uh, make sure none of them leave during this uh, panel, they'll be in trouble. Um, so I wanna introduce our speakers and then uh, I'll have them come up one by one to give their uh, kind of introductory uh, statements before we open it up uh, for questions. I have a few questions myself I'll probably start out with and then and then we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience. Dr. Guy ben Parad is a professor at the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University. His research and publications engage with Israeli and world politics, peace processes, religion, and ethnicity. He teaches courses on international relations, globalization, religion and politics, and policing. He received his PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University. Among his books are Policing Citizens, Minority Policy in Israel, and Between State and Synagogue, The Secularization of Contemporary Israel. Dr. Nasreen Haddad Hajahia, here on my left, is one of the leading researchers in Israel on Arab societies, economic and social development, on related government, uh, governmental policies, and on majority-minority relations in Israel. Nasreen was deeply involved in building and formulating the Israeli government's major decisions related to the development of Arab society, especially as they relate to employment, education, and the younger generation in Arab society, which are her unique fields of expertise. Nasreen is the co-founder and co-CEO of NAS, People in Arabic, an Arab Jewish consulting company that specializes in issues relating to Arab society in Israel. Dr. Michael Koplau is the Chief Policy Officer of Israel Policy Forum, IPF, and also serves as a Senior Research Fellow of the Kogod Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. Previously, he was a Founding Director of the Israel Institute. He holds a PhD in government from Georgetown University, where he specialized in political development and ideology and the politics of Middle Eastern states. He writes IPF's weekly Kapla column and edits Israel Policy Exchange, which is leading, a leading source for commentary and analysis on Israel and American Jewry, and his work regularly appears in other major publications. And finally, Dr. Gail Telshir teaches political science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Telshir's research focuses on the crisis of legitimation of advanced democracies, party system change, political ideologies, and Israeli politics. She founded the Center for Top Government Officials and developed programs for newly elected mayors, civil servants, and senior leaders of Israel's public sector. She's the author of several books, including Taking Ideology Seriously and her forthcoming Judocracy, the Netanyahu Era. And I assume you're busy updating that as we speak. Dr. Talshir received her PhD from the University of Oxford and presently serves as visiting professor at UCLA. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists. I'm gonna call up Nasreen for the first presentation. Okay, good, afterno good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Nasreen Haddad Hajihia. I live in Taibe, an Arab city in the middle of Israel. Um, as a member of the Arab minority in Israel, I'm still trying to slow, swallow um, the scary result of the election. And I feel that the new government is racing to power because of the hate and fear of the societies that I belong to, the Arab minority, the Palestinian minority in Israel. Because my time is limited, um, I will focus... Um, I'll focus my presentation mostly uh, on the political realities of Arab society in Israel, but I will also link this to deeper socioeconomic uh, challenges and realities uh, on the ground.
Well, these victims are all Arab uh, citizens of Israel who were killed due, the, uh, due to violence inside Arab society uh, in the last three months. Well, uh, well, why I'm showing you these uh, pictures and data for two reasons, because I want you to understand that this is our reality. And this is what we are dealing with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So when everybody here talk about political participation and 21 uh, century skills and startup nation, this pandemic of crime and violence is what Arab citizens in Israel are really thinking about. Because, and the second reason is because this is a good segue through which we can talk about the status of Arab minority in Israel today. Because really, at the end of the day, there is a basic question about our status. Are we citizens who deserve services, budgets, and, and equal opportunities, uh, including po policing and protection from violence? Or are we a threat that the country needs to take care of and to treat? Um, towards the last um, couple of elections, there were very important organization and group in, uh, inside Arab society promoting voting participation. This is because that they, and I believe that it's very important to have our place around the decision-making table and voice uh, our own needs, beliefs, and agendas. There is growing uh, frustration in Arab society, and there is a growing movement calling to boycott national uh, elections. But so far, all major Arab political forces have been participating in the democratic game. The two parties that managed to enter the Knesset, Ram and Khadash Tal, are offering uh, different uh, ways, but are under the same uh, assumption of equality and partnership. And even Balad, which is more, much more critical uh, of the Israeli political system, is playing uh, the political game and running for the Knesset. This, this is a very good news for the Israeli democracy. We should all want to be, uh, we should want all group in society to participate in the democratic game, uh, especially such a large ethnic national, uh, national uh, religious minority. Well, in the recent years, Arab parties have made significant steps to become partner in, to, to, in political leadership. Uh, Mansour Abbas, the leader of Ram Party that was part of the recent coalition, went all the way in. This was the first time that an Arab party was part of the government coalition, and it's important to understand the differences, uh, the different views of, Air, of Jews and Arabs about this. Among Arab society, many supported him, but many also saw what, uh, that despite all his efforts to be part uh, of the coalition, and all, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, he uh, remained um, very weak, and uh, um, uh, he couldn't have, he didn't have the ability to really to, to influence the government uh, uh, decisions. Meanwhile, on the Jewish side, our political leaders uh, and uh, even our society uh, are seen as terror supporters uh, by the majority, by the by the Jewish majority. Well, I believe this 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 that uh, this lead us to many uh, of Jewish citizens to vote for Ben Gvir, who base uh, bases so much of his ideology uh, on hatred and fears of Arabs. Well, despite uh, the worry and even depressing pictures that I have painted, uh, we refuse, we as Arab minority refuse to give up and we as a society refuse to be second, second class citizen. We want to be part and we will continue to work for it. And I, I see around me many reasons also to be optimistic. Yeah, there are forces that are trying to push us apart and to make sure that we don't talk, that we don't give there's a uh, birth in the same rooms, uh, but that our children do not meet. But there are, are also uh, more and more organization and um, individuals working to create 
and equal and shared societies. There are more professional Arab civil society organization, and there are Jew Jewish and Arab partners working together in all uh, walks of life. Uh, we, me and my lot of friends are uh, have been dedicating our life and professional career promote, to promote socioeconomic development and the integration of Arab uh, minority in Israel, as also as well uh, to promote Jewish Arab partnership. But the recent discourse and um, uh, the parties that are about to lead uh, the next government are working against Jewish Arab partnership against integration. And I'm really worried about the future of my society and the future of uh, the state of Israel. I know that many of you also worried about uh, rights of other group and Israel like the LGBTQ community. And this is of course true, but, uh, but it's quite clear that the Arab minority in Israel um, has the most to fear. And I hope that you as a Jewish minor uh, minority in the state, um, with your historical uh, perspective of minority rights will be uh, will be our partners to uh, will be partners to us uh, um, and help us to fight uh, for our rights um, in this uh, um, in this really scary reality that we uh, we, we we're facing now. Um, thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, thank thank you, Guy, and thank you to the Center for Israel Studies here uh, for hosting hosting this conference and inviting me to to speak. Um, as the as the only, I'm going to assume the only non-Israeli citizen uh, on, on this panel, um, I'm going to try to zoom out a little bit and and look at some of the broader themes that we might want to think about in considering what happens next for Israel and and what does it mean for Israeli democracy. So one of these is how we define democracy. What, is, what does democracy actually mean? Um, you know, there, I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who, uh, who have studied political science or who are political scientists. And in political science, there are hundreds of different definitions of what it means to be a democracy. But there really is, I think, uh, a breakdown between two fundamental approaches. One is an approach that is about process. Um, democracy is about voting, right? You have elections and whoever wins elections is in power. And uh, that's how you judge whether a country is democratic. And you know we can call this, for lack of a better term, majoritarian electoral democracy, right? You vote, free and fair, the government's in power and, and they do as they please. The other basic model of democracy is focused much more on substance than it is on process. Of course, you have to have free and fair elections. You have to have a government that takes power in a legitimate way. But what the government then does matters to whether you deem a country to be democratic or not. And so we wouldn't call this electoral democracy. We would call this, for, for lack of a better shorthand, liberal democracy. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, this is what we are facing when we look at what may take place in Israel with this new government over the next few years. Uh, on the one hand, there is this notion, and you know we see it a lot, and I think we've seen it since the election, Israelis voted. The election was free and fair by, by, by any standard. The government will take power, and what that government does is democratic. It's the democratic elected government of Israel, and and uh, people have to respect the results of elections. Now, this is a model that is certainly familiar to folks who study the rest of the region. This is, uh, in a lot of ways, the same model that we've seen in Turkey under the AKP and uh, first prime minister and now president Erdogan. This idea that if you win the election, whatever happens next, you have the right to do because you won an election. Um, the other model, and and again, we we are starting to see some of these uh, types of messages, I think, coming from some of the folks in the prospective new Israeli government, um, who say the voters have spoken, and you know, elections have consequences. Another another phrase that uh, that we've heard here in the United States, uh, I think, uh, in, in recent history. Um, on the other hand, there is the idea that what a government does after the election certainly matters. 
um, and all the questions that are in the air now in Israel about separation of powers, about the balance between the Knesset and the Supreme Court, uh, about how Israel is going to treat its Arab minority, certainly about uh, how Israel is going to treat um, Palestinians who are not citizens of Israel in, in the West Bank um, or Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. These are all questions that can also go to uh, the issue of whether, whether Israel is a democracy uh, and how we are going to define that term. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I think that there are questions about rule of law that will determine what Israel's democracy looks like going forward. Some of the things that are being contemplated. Um, so, you know, one one I just brief, briefly briefly flew by, but uh, that is the question about the Supreme Court and the Knesset. To what extent is the court going to have oversight of, of the Knesset? And to what extent is the Knesset going to be able to operate as freely as it wants? Now, you know, in Israel, this is, of course, uh, in many ways more complicated than it is here, because unlike here, Israel does not have a constitution. Um, the question of whether the Supreme Court has oversight of the Knesset and can deem laws to be uh, in in contravention of Israel's basic laws, which is effectively Israel's non-constitutional constitution, uh, that's not something that's really laid out. That's a that's a power that the Israeli High Court has over time assumed for itself. And one of the things that's on the prospective new government's agenda, I think probably top of the list, is and I'm. I'm Sure, we'll hear about this more uh, uh, from from other panelists. Uh, is about whether Israel will pass the Knesset will pass a law saying that the Supreme Court effectively does not have oversight. That if the Knesset passes something by majority, then that's the end. Um, and that definitely goes to questions of rule of law. What does it What does it mean to have What does it mean to have rule of law? Um, is it only about a legislature, or does the judiciary have a say? Uh, other things that are being contemplated, for instance, uh, changing the rules of engagement for the IDF and the police in a way that will reduce accountability for IDF soldiers and for uh, Israeli police. Um, again, these are questions about rule of law. When you reduce accountability for security services, there's always going to be a balance between uh, between security and, and liberty. Um, but this question about rule of law comes comes into play. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see these in a, and I, I guess I should throw in there as well, uh, former and soon to be Prime Minister Netanyahu's trials uh, here as well. If the Knesset passes a law that says fraud and breach of trust are no longer crimes. Um, and so Netanyahu's trials, except for the one counter bribery, go away. What does this also mean for rule of law? Is it, is it democratic to um, cancel a law in the middle in order to get one person out of a trial? Um, I'm not sure, I certainly have my opinions. I'm not sure that there's, you know, a definitive yes or no answer, but I think that these all uh, go to the questions of, of rule of law and what that will mean for Israeli democracy. And then um, lastly, I think there's a question about when we speak of Israeli democracy, who participates? We're now in uh, year 55 of Israel's occupation of the West Bank. And what that means is that there are somewhere between 2.8 and 3 million Palestinians living in the West Bank who are under direct Israeli control, um, even, even if they are living in Area A, which is, uh, in theory, under full Palestinian security and civil control. But there were over 600 IDF uh, raids into Area A just last month. So I think that uh, it's pretty safe to say that uh, Palestinians in Area A are under direct Israeli control. Um, they don't have a right to vote. Now, there are lots of, I think, legitimate reasons for why that is the case. I think there are you know, plenty, plenty of ways to, to defend this. Um, but the key to any defense of this is that this is a temporary military occupation. It is not permanent, or at least not officially permanent. Um, now, the new government is contemplating all sorts of things, including annexing not just Area C, but the entirety of the West Bank, including uh, applying Israeli sovereignty only to the 127 Israeli communities in the West Bank, but not to the Palestinians who live there, including possibly making le retroactively legalizing the uh, over 150 outposts in the West Bank that are illegal under Israeli law, um, but not doing something similar for the various Palestinian communities in Area C that are also deemed to be illegal under Israeli law. And so if these steps are taken, 
and this becomes under Israeli law and under Israeli politics, a permanent situation. And yet the Palestinians who are in the West Bank don't enjoy the same political and civil rights as Israeli citizens. Then uh, the questions that have always existed about the right to participate and who counts, I think become even more supercharged when we're talking about whether Israel is a democracy. Um, one of the things that that I think many of us are used to hearing and, and saying and voicing is Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And when we say that, we generally mean Israeli territory inside the Green Line. If the situation is formally changed and Israeli territory under Israeli law now includes territory beyond the Green Line, but the status there doesn't change for the people who are not Jews and who are not Israeli citizens, then I think we're living in a very different world when we talk about Israeli democracy. Um, so I think you know there, there are there are many more issues, and I know uh, we'll be discussing more of them. But uh, you know those are three that uh, that I think people should be thinking about uh, when we when we zoom out and think about what happens next for for Israel and its democracy. Um, since this is the last panel, maybe I want to connect to what uh, started us off, and uh, that was uh, Michael's um, declaration, maybe, of uh, yesterday saying uh, it is about demography, isn't it? And I want to challenge uh, your assumption that it's just about demography, and I want to try to uh, um, interest you in a different thesis that says it is about ideology. Now, it's going to be very hard to convince you of that, because if I ask you what is the one thing that these five rounds of elections were about, you are going to say yes or no, Bibi, right? So it was very, very personal, only about Netanyahu. And even so, I want to try to convince you that it is about ideology and that if I have to say it in one sentence, Israel has moved from a multi-ethnic uh, democracy into being a polarized society, and that we need to understand, first of all, the ideological uh, connections that connect the national camp on the one end and uh, the other camp on the other end, but also maybe to understand that ideology is always a construction and it can be reconstructed. So that may be something uh, positive that I'll try to say. Now, I want to uh, 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 very briefly, let's see where it goes. No, it doesn't work. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, whatever, um, I can do without it. So in terms of theory, I want to propose to you the following idea. Over the last seven years, we were in a situation which we theorists call populism in power. Populism in power is different to other uh, ways of thinking about populism, because if somebody says populism, usually you think about Putin or Erdogan or uh, undemocratic uh, uh, regimes on the one hand, or you think about the far right in uh, in uh, European democracies uh, that uh, that arose uh, um, significantly over the last uh, couple of years. But then populism in power, we talk about leaders that lead the ruling parties of the right, that usually are moderate right-wing parties, that as leaders, they took them to the extreme populist national conservative uh, uh, edge of it. That means that the major ruling right-wing party is actually going to the extreme edge of nationalism. And the one thing that connects uh, Trump in the US and uh, Viktor Orban in uh, Hungary and Netanyahu in Israel, and I could list uh, uh, three, four more such leaders, is that liberalism becomes the enemy. And how did we get into a situation where the Likud, Likud was Chirut was the Liberty Party, and the uh, Gachal was uh, the uh, the alliance between the liberals and uh, and the uh, Chirut. How did we get into a situation where the major right wing party, which is a liberal uh, national party, turns around and against liberalism? So where did this uh, come from? And thank you so much. And my idea is that it comes. Uh, from uh, um, this stage of populism in power. We did have one year of coalition of change. And what is different now, that will be my uh, final argument to you, is that today we have both populism in power and the rise of the far right. So this is what's different 
um, in uh, this election still there, but I can do without it again if, uh, yeah, okay. I can't go through all of it, but I want to give you three points of uh, historical uh, um, significance. One is, as you remember, 1996, uh, Finkelstein is an advisor to Netanyahu, and he has this poll asking people, what do you feel more? Are you Jewish or Israeli? And to the amazement of uh, the polar and to and Netanyahu, most of the right wingers say we are first and foremost Jewish, and most of the leftists say we're first and foremost Israeli. And that's going to be the main line of building what is, from my perspective, Netanyahu's biggest creation, that is the national camp. The other, it will take 10 years. In 2006, the Likud is going to um, drop to abysmal uh, results of uh, 12 uh, mandates only uh, with Netanyahu as the head. And in 2007, Netanyahu comes here to the States. And in 2007, uh, um, the uh, uh, Fox News has been established and Netanyahu says the following. He says, we in Israel see uh, America as only uh, um, San Francisco and uh, New York, but in between lies a different America. And when Netanyahu plans the national camp, he thinks about this different or other uh, Israel, meaning the Israel of the developmental town, the, uh, the uh, Haredi uh, cities, etc. So the construct of an other Israel actually comes from experiencing Fox News and the audience of Fox News uh, here in 2009. 2009, Netanyahu gets back into power. It will take several years. But in 2015, we heard about it in the morning when Netanyahu comes on the election day and says, the Arabs are go going uh, in droves to, uh, uh, to vote. It's the buses of the left organizations that take them there. We don't have V15, the organizations. We have what? Tzav Shmone, the IDF, God, and the national camp. So this is the two camps. You have the idea of uh, and God with the national camp, and you have the Arabs and the leftist organizations on the other side. And this is how you delegitimize your uh, opponents. The, the, he doesn't, uh, in 2015, he doesn't care about the Arab voters. He cares about delegitimizing the left. And it's going to go from the left to the center and from the center to the liberal right. So again, I don't have time to uh, go through all the, uh, uh, the all, all the notions, but what you can see if you take just a snapshot of the uh, five electoral cycles that we just had. In 2019, the major issue was the basic law nation state. And you can see that the right wing is on the extreme and they're all united for this law. Now, the one central thing about this law, as we heard also yesterday, is that it gives collective rights, in this case, to the Jews, and doesn't mention at all civic rights to all citizens. This is not a democratic law. You can, under no other democracy, you do not have such a constitutional law, which means that this is a major, major point of departure uh, from being a liberal democracy. The next election uh, in, uh, in uh, 2019, as you remember, Lieberman, a right winger, defects from Netanyahu's coalition. Yes, there were personal strifes between him and Netanyahu, but the major issue is state religion relations. And the, the campaign coming in September 2019 from Lieberman is saying uh, liberal uh, state, secular state versus uh, what uh, Lieberman calls a extremist uh, messianic uh, uh, um, uh, fundamental state, which is what we are now on the verge of. So Lieberman is the first uh, guy coming from the uh, from the right uh, to this uh, coalition of change. Then you have, of course, uh, Gidon Saar. Gidon Saar and Bennett and Lieberman, they are, we can call them not just liberal nationals, but they are conservative. They think about the constitutional revolution, everything that Ayala Chaked uh, and uh, Yariv Levin think. But they understand that if you take the constitutional revolution and the battle against the uh, uh, constitutional revolution to the extreme of serving one person who wants the, uh, the loyalty of the people and of uh, uh, all the citizens of Israel, then you are in a very difficult spot. And this is why they leave 
the loyal camp to Netanyahu, and they move. They haven't changed. They are still right wingers, but they are liberal right wingers, and they move on to the coalition of change. So here you can see that already in 2020, you have a polarized society, uh, uh, right and uh, liberal uh, camp. And this is going to be reproduced in 2000, uh, in 21 and in 22. I can't go into uh, the details because I want to show you, first of all, this from a multi uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, variance to two polarized blocks. And second, I want to say just one word because I have two more minutes maybe uh, uh, about where how this polarization works and it works on two different channels what it means to be Jewish what it means to be a democracy on the Jewish front this is a, a 2020 uh, 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 poll asking what the balance between Jewish and Israeli and you can see that all the Haredi the ultra orthodox and the religious people are saying Israel is too democratic you can see on the other side all the secular and very interestingly all the um, the majority of the Masorti non-religious people are saying Israel is too Jewish, meaning too religious. Okay, which means that we are in a polarized situation, which was not the case not 70 years ago, not 60, not 50. This is a divide which is handmade. It was orchestrated to have such a divide because you can be a Jewish and democratic state with all the conflicts uh, it involves still. But somebody wanted to make sure that this is the kind of polarization and that if you feel Jewish first, you are going to vote for the right answer, which is the right. And the last point, because uh, maybe we'll get back to it in the discussion, people always tell you uh, that all Israelis uh, feel that uh, they don't have trust in the Supreme Court. And you look at this uh, uh, 2020 uh, graph uh, coming from the Israel uh, Democracy Institute and you say, yeah, it dropped the uh, trust of, uh, of uh, Israelis in the Supreme Court from around 80 uh, in uh, 2003 to around 50 in, two, in 2020, actually 48% in a, a, a last year's uh, poll. But then look at these results. If you take the same thing and just divide it by the self ascribement uh, of politics, you see that the left and the center, the majority of Israelis uh, uh, and the Arabs that we saw before have very high trust in the uh, Supreme Court. It's only the right wing that today identified itself as uh, having no trust in the Supreme Court. Why is this the case? Uh, very briefly, we have five different groups in uh, making the right wing that actually uh, form this idea that equality, which is the main uh, equality and liberty, the two main uh, issues that the uh, Supreme Court protects, actually have uh, long beef with them. So the ultra-Orthodox, we talked about them, they don't want to be recruited to the IDF, they don't want the equality to be part of our basic law. The, this is the first group. Already in 1998, uh, Gaffney proposes uh, the override clause. The second group is the settlements that have a longer uh, standing conflict with the Supreme Court about uh, the authorization uh, of uh, the settlements. The third is the uh, uh, anti mistanenim group that uh, uh, I don't have time to discuss. And then the anti-constitutionalists, the conservatives that take the American uh, approach to neoconservatism and import it into Israeli. This is a very, very well-established uh, a uh, group that had a lot of uh, uh, um, of uh, civil rights organizations, civil rights of uh, uh, civil society organizations, uh, from Im uh, Tirzu to uh, uh, Tikva Foundation to uh, Forum Koelete, etc., and they lead ideologically this uh, thing. And Netanyahu is just the latecomer to this group. And uh, when he is here with uh, opening his trial, he says, and I'll finish with that. People in the police, the attorney uh, general office, and the media try to execute a coup d'etat against the will of the people. And this is the major thing. The populism in power says that it is the leader who represents the will of the people. And all these unelected elites actually try to take him off power. And that's the kind of polarization uh, that uh, we see today. And the new government that gets into power today is uh, established from this 
groups and they are much more adamant about the changes than maybe Netanyahu himself. And this is why if we ask about what's going to be uh, the, uh, the future of Israeli democracy, I think uh, we do have things to fear for, but maybe I have a different opinion. Thank you. Not that different. Um, I'll start with the obvious. Uh, we talked about the election for the past two days, but there are 1.3 million people who are happy with the results of this election. We have to take that into account. So there is a um, large majority of Israelis who are happy with this result. It could be a stable government. Another may be bad news for many people. And you know, stability has been something we desired. So maybe we should be careful with what you desire for. And thirdly, that when we talk about uh, the two camps, the liberalism and the non-liberalism, the liberal camp, the 1.3 million is a lie. But among this 1.3 million, you have people like Lieberman, who by no standards are liberals. So I think the results are much more decisive than what we think. However, I want to do two things. First, to talk about liberalism and what is it in Israel, and then I maybe offer a glimpse of, of hope for the future. So we're lamenting liberalism here, but in Israel, liberalism always was with a small L. It was a liberalism that worked mostly for the Jewish collective, maybe for the affluent part of the Jewish collective. What we've seen in recent uh, three decades maybe is a growing process of secularization, which is not the same as liberalism. So the religious authority in the past 30 years has declined due to some struggles of ideological religious liberals, but mostly to demography, Russian immigration, and the market economy. So these three things, and mostly the last two, created those liberal spaces, which are significant. So the Shabbat has been secularized. If you compare Israel today of 40 years ago, we have a Shabbat, which you can shop and you can go to restaurants, something new. I mean, we see it today as natural, but it's not natural. It's a development of the demography and the economy. Family life has been secularized. Rate of divorce is growing, uh, different families are emerging, single mothers, uh, et cetera. So we are kind of following trends in the Western world. Uh, LGBTQ rights have expanded. Again, we see this as something natural, but Beersheba, which is a conservative town, has a parade every year. So does Jerusalem. So these things happened in the past uh, two or three decades. They are not the result of ideology. There's liberalism that's driven by, I'd say, mostly economic forces and some demography. So this liberalism, with a small L, may I remind you, seems to be a danger at the moment. Uh, but how in danger is it for those who most enjoy it? And I'm asking this because I think for liberalism to be able to renew itself, it has to expand, be much more bolder and much more inclusive. So I think for people like me, in our de general life, the danger is rather small. Shops will be open on Shabbat. We will play football on Shabbat. I doubt this will change because the economy is too strong. But again, this is a very limited and lean and maybe poor liberalism. And that's where I think we need to think of what's going to be, happen next. Just to open the brackets here, in the 1990s, we had this thesis that we have to make peace because liberal economy requires peace. So the peace is dead. Liberal economy is thriving. So I think we need to talk about ideology, not about these external forces, to discuss what liberalism should be. I want to try and offer here uh, three contradictions in this government, or maybe three cracks through which liberalism and new liberalism might emerge. First, I think, is the changes of religious, that religious Zionism. I call this the Bennett Project. Ten years ago, Naftali Bennett had the image of a new hegemony a religious party which is inclusive. And it, on the one hand, it was hawkish on foreign policy, but liberal with a small L on internal policy. So regarding LGBT rights and seculars, Bennett was saying, we love you all, you're all brothers. Uh, and this idea has failed because Bennett could not really become the new leading party. And as you mentioned here, he barely passed the threshold. He became prime minister by a fluke, by accident. That's not a victory. And that's why it ended the way it ended. There was never, never, never something substantial there. The new party, Smotrich and Bengvil, is very different. It's an orthodox party, very anti-liberal. And I think that might, in the not so long run, 
bring it into clashes with many people that may be sympathetic. I'm not sure today if you go against LGBT rights or against football on Shabbat. I'm not comparing the two, of course. I'm not sure you'll get much popularity there. And it's already you see you saw the, the reactions when they were pushing these balloons in the air. Um, and the more, it's hard to say liberal here, but the more moderate centrist religious Zionism has disappeared. So Bennett's project has died. And for the moment, there's no one representing the more less uh, uh, radical uh, uh, right-wing Zionism. That's one change, one crack. Second is the ultra-Orthodox, the Chaladim. And as people said yesterday, there is a major trend here. They're becoming more nationalist, more right-wing, and more anti-Arab. But then there's a, there's a deeper change here. Haredi society is facing the uh, general society. And as they become closer, they're also exposed to more dangers. And there's a deep crisis among Haredi society. Uh, we just finished a, a, a research on policing during COVID-19 among the Haredim. And what we get between the lines is a very deep distrust of their leadership. Our leadership failed us. We were sick and we died and we can't trust our leadership. So yes, they're going more to the right, becoming more patriotic, but as the rabbis know, if you become more patriotic and more right-wing, how can you resist military service? So that's where they're exposed to danger. I don't think it's a, it's a very whole project. Thirdly, and Nasreen mentioned that, was the issue of personal security. The right was able to capitalize on the issue of security. The, now, here's the point. Uh, for years now, we've been saying that Arab citizens are under police. We, researchers and Arab citizens themselves, just to give you the numbers, uh, Arab citizens are 20% of the population. They account for 70% of the homicides in Israel. That's the numbers. Arab cities have become unbearable to live in, in fear of crime. And for the majority of Jewish people, this was not a concern. It was in their towns and villages. We become concerned now because it spills out. And the right wing was able to capitalize on that. We will bring you security. However, anyone who researches police knows that there's no simple solution to that. It's a structural problem. Throwing in more cops in the streets with more guns and more jail, if we learn from the US experience, does not bring security. So while the right wing has this promise, this works well in the opposition. But when you're in power, I think that's a crack that the left should expand. And the left had too little to say about these things. So while the right wing was able to capitalize on security, the left pretty much kept silent, also on the structural issues behind that. Uh, so I think all these cracks kind of uh, allow us to think of maybe new political structures, more inclusive, not the old thin liberal that is dying, but maybe it's time for that. And maybe for a place for civil society to be more active and fill in those gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we we now heard from uh, our four panelists, um, very interesting and intriguing ideas, I would say. Uh, and I'm going to come back to a couple of them in a minute. But I have a question, and and maybe Nasreen, I think maybe this would be uh, a good opportunity for you to respond first, but anybody can respond to this question. And that has to do with the new coalition, the emerging coalition's top priority, which is passing what they call judicial reform. And um, what it intends to do and Netanyahu has indicated he's interested in going ahead with it, is to uh, pass this parliamentary override clause, uh, which would enable the elected officials to overturn Supreme Court decisions, possibly even with just a 61 uh, uh, MK majority. And in such, uh, so in effect, such legislation would weaken the Supreme Court and enable politicians to bypass judicial oversight. Uh, Michael, I believe you alluded to this legislation in your comments. So I would, I'd like to know what are the implications of these proposed changes to the legal system for the Arab uh, minority uh, in Israel, first and foremost, but to Israeli democracy more generally? First, I want to say that the Supreme Court in Israel did not protect us, okay? Um, 
Yeah, we, we saw uh, in your statistics, um, Tamar Herman's statistics at the Israel Democracy Institute, that we have a lot of faith in the Supreme Court. But unfortunately, when the, the Supreme Court needed to protect us, he didn't, he haven't done that. Not for, not for the Palestinian living in Israel and also not for the Palestinian living under the occupation in the West Bank and, and in Gaza. So unfortunately, um, people do not believe that it's gonna be, it's gonna change for us uh, because Supreme Court have been dealing with issues that served uh, and protected mainly the majority in, in Israel, not not minorities, especially not Palestinian one, not about property, not about landing, not about uh, issues that related to our daily daily and our about also about our collective rights. So uh, uh, so I don't I don't believe that there will be, be there will be um, main changes, especially after uh, also after the nation state law that give uh, the Jewish majority um, extra privileges that than they that they had uh, before. Um, but I I want to say that uh, although the Supreme, Supreme Court did not protect us uh, in the past, uh, us as minority, we cannot uh, give up on this institution. I want uh, the Supreme Court to be, uh, to know that this institution uh, that I as a, that I can relay on in the future, and un unfortunately, uh, the majority of us give up on 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 this, and so I'm not really optimistic about uh, this specific issue. And we know that from the perspective of the right, of the Israeli political right, the Supreme Court hampers so many of the decisions they'd like to make. So it's interesting that from their perspective. The Supreme Court most definitely does not represent them, which is one of the reasons I think they're behind this. But I, I'd like to hear from maybe one, maybe a response uh, from that kind of perspective. Uh, what is, uh, you're not necessarily representing the right, but what would be the implications for Israeli democracy uh, in addition to what Nasreen had to say? Yeah. Any, any of you? Oh, yeah. I can, I can take it. Uh, it's not just about the override clause, there's a bundle of reforms that are on the table. Um, so one is the override clause, which is not about the Knesset, it's about the government. If you give 61 um, a majority, it means that the government can overrule, that it has no checks and balances because nobody can say, and you can say in the papers, you can write op-eds as long as you want, but it means that uh, the government can override any uh, decision that needs to that wants to protect uh, human rights, uh, minority rights, uh, um, uh, and any and any other things that doesn't coil uh, that doesn't line up with uh, their idea. The main thing which is going to be uh, now is the uh, exemption of the Haredi from uh, the IDF, which is the next thing on the table. But this is only one part. The second part is uh, changing the way that uh, uh, Supreme Judges are being appointed. Uh, they want the politicians to appoint them like in the States, but in the States you have many other checks and balances. In Israel, you don't. So this is another thing. The, the third thing, which is maybe the most crucial one, is the politicization of civil uh, uh, servant uh, uh, and especially the judicial, uh, the uh, attorney general, the idea that it's going to be the loyal person to the minister or to the prime minister. So meaning that the rule of law would not be what he wants to protect but to protect the government from uh, from uh, any uh, criticism against it, uh, which means the politicization of civil service uh, and uh, taking out all the professional uh, um, outlook of uh, Israeli civil service. Uh, and uh, and uh, this kind of things can also benefit Netanyahu's own trial because uh, you can then uh, take, as you mentioned, uh, uh, away the uh, um, uh, certain of, uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, allegations against him, but also you can have uh, essential immunity, you can have uh, retroactive uh, French law, you can have all kinds of legislation and it will come to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will say it's unconstitutional and the Knesset will say, well, we're very sorry, but we have the upper end and therefore uh, the government uh, cancels uh, this criticism. So, yeah, there are implications for Netanyahu's trial, but the big thing is 
uh, that this government wants to change the rules of the game, not just to play within the game. And I think this is what's, uh, what's uh, crucial. And I think they don't care about the readers of arts. They care about getting it right from their perspective. And the big goal is to annex the, the settlements, uh, of course, not to give civil rights to Palestinians, not to, ever on the cards uh, and maybe uh, have some sort of a trial of loyalty, which I will not pass, not just the Palestinians won't pass. Because if you want loyalty to a Jewish religious state, I am not loyal to such a state. So you can put me in jail, which they will. So that this is where it's not about just the Palestinians. It's about whether you have a Jewish democratic state and what they can do or cannot do uh, and the kind of power that they have, I think you don't even have to change any law. The kind of the, the, the uh, slogan that Ben Gvir came to this election was, we are the Baal Bait. We are the rules, rulers here. And if you don't like it, go away. So I think the intimidation, you don't need to pass any law. It's already there. It's going to be very violent. And it's going to be very violent, both in the political culture and in the uh, uh, reality of lives of people, especially in the Arab uh, uh, villages and the Palestinian villages, but we see it in the universities. We don't need to go uh, to the authorities to see it. And maybe, Michael, you can say a word about this, because this ties in with your first definition of democracy, right? The kind of idea that these are elected officials, and therefore, why not just go with a simple majority as opposed to the unelected courts? Yeah, I, I can. So I can. I can play right winger for for a moment, reasonably well. Um, so I think that the the right wing argument in favor of these things, without just saying you know we want to do as we please, um, would be that um, in the Israeli system there 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 is no balance. The judicial, the unelected judicial system, or you know, the deep state bureaucracy has amassed all sorts of power. And uh, in a parliamentary system in particular, you only have one democratically elected body, and that is the Knesset. And so the argument is that the balance has swung way too far over to the side of unelected officials who don't have democratic legitimacy and that they have not been uh, selected by the people of Israel. And therefore, you need to do something to to change this balance, right? And so that's that's the defense of saying, listen, the if the Supreme Court says that uh, a Knesset law is unconstitutional, there is no recourse. There's no path to overturning that. So we should provide some sort of path. Um, you know, with the Judges Selection Committee, it's it's made up currently of nine people. Three of them are Supreme Court justices. Two of them are members of the Israeli Bar Association, and four are members of Knesset and the government. And so there too, um, what that means is that the unelected judges or bar association professionals can have control over who gets appointed to the Supreme Court, even if even if all four Knesset members are united, doesn't matter. And so change it so that you still have nine, but three of them are judges and six of them are members of Knesset or the government, and therefore that's being more responsive to uh, to democracy and and to the wishes of the people. The same goes for. Um, advisors in different ministries. Um, you know, but I think members of members of Knesset or members of the government would say, why is it that if we become ministers of, of whichever ministry it is, we are saddled with unelected legal advisors? Why can't we bring in the legal advisor we want? Um, or with the attorney general, the argument would be uh, Netanyahu was, was elected over and over again by the Israeli people and uh, a bunch of Prosecutors in the state attorney's office decided that they don't like him, and so they brought trumped up charges and uh, and forced this entire political crisis. Um, why can't we have an attorney general who doesn't have this power, whose job it is simply to defend the priorities of the government? Um, now, I'll you know say I don't I don't I don't buy any of these arguments myself, but I I do think that um, they are not illegitimate, right? There there is a reason that these policies are being grounded in these types of arguments with appeals to democracy and, and, you know, specifically saying, listen, we have elections in, in Israel and people vote for, for certain policies and, and, and for parties. So it shouldn't be that uh, actors who are outside of the political system um, get to have all this sway over Israeli democracy. I think that would, that would be the argument. And Sky, I don't know if you want to respond to this or I can move on Just to the next one. Senator, I, I share your concerns, but I think that the problem might be that we have 
become reliant on the Supreme Court to protect liberalism rather than have partners who are committed to that. That's, I think, a very problematic stance. So Guy, you earlier you brought up this intriguing idea of the growing pro what you call the growing process of secularization. And I want to touch upon the issue of identity and national identity, especially Jewish identity, which has been a big theme uh, in these recent elections, especially the last one. Um, so uh, many Israelis who feared that Israel is losing its Jewish identity voted for the far-right religious Zionism party that they felt would kind of more closely uh, and strongly reinforce the country's Jewish identity. And in fact, one of the new MKs, Avi Maoz of the religious Zionism's Noam faction, said after the elections that he intends to form a new Knesset committee that's going to deal specifically with promoting Jewish identity. Uh, but this isn't only an issue that's important to the Israeli right. The uh, Zionist left, liberal Zionists, have often talked about this issue as well because they're concerned of demographic realities that uh, could leave Jews in a as a minority in their own country. So I'd like to ask uh, what you think the uh, maybe we can start with you, Guy. What we think of, what you think about the impact that these anxieties have on the democratic character of the state of Israel, uh, in 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 light of this kind of emphasis, heavy emphasis on Jewish identity. I think Avi Maoz is a very extreme example that I'm not sure how popular it would be in the general public. There is a consensus among Jewish Israelis that Israel is a Jewish state, but what to make of it is where you begin to argue. And I think there are contradictions. You know, when we do surveys and we ask people about their Jewish identity, uh, we get those very different results because it depends what you ask. Is it about believing in God? Is it about observing religious rituals? Is it about the way you identify yourself? And these, these things come very, very uh, uh, inconclusive. So people might, you know, believe that they're good Jews, you know, they shop on Shabbat. People who shop on Shabbat will describe themselves as Masotim, we're traditional. Uh, they will not eat pork, because that's going too far. They will not vote for liberal parties necessarily. So this whole Jewish identity thing, I think, is such a complex issue that can be played in different ways. I, I really find, find it difficult to say that people know what it means to be a more Jewish state. Uh, I mean, people have their own opinions, but I think there's there's such a variety in there and, and so, so many contradictions that I'm not sure it's the major issue. So I think the, the Israel losing its Jewish character can be related to security issues. Uh, for some people, it's about identity. We have these gay parades. That's, of course, uh, uh, something that you, you can't have. But I don't think there's there's a kind of, kind of conclusive idea of what a Jewish identity of a state is. I want to say a word about the other, because you talk about the right wing, we don't talk about um, the center left or the liberal um, camp. And I think um, it was conceived in 2011 when we had the uh, largest uh, social uh, protest in Israel. And uh, I don't take it that it was about economics. I think it was uh, about the character of Israel. And the one major concept that emerged from there, both by Eitzik Shmuley and Yair Lapid himself, was the concept of Israelis or Israeliness. And I think this is the, the other way of looking at being both the Jewish state of the, um, the sovereign state of the Jewish people and a democracy. And I think Israeliness as an inclusive concept that all Israeli citizens can, uh, can share and can take part in uh, is what's going against uh, the most uh, extremist uh, religious interpretation of Smotrich and Derry and Gaffney and Ben Gvir uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the major partners of uh, Netanyahu's uh, government. Mind you, Netanyahu himself is a secular uh, uh, Jew, but this has never played um, um, a central issue in his because already from 2013, when Netanyahu has his campaigns, uh, he doesn't talk about the state, he talks about the Jewish people. And Netanyahu perceives himself as the great leader of the Jewish people, not of the Israelis. And I think uh, the distinction between Jewish and Israeliness, and of course, the left is not less Jewish than the right but he thinks about his Jewishness in national uh, terms and secular terms, and he does care about civic uh, 
uh, equality. And I think this is the other uh, end of this uh, uh, Jewish uh, um, identity thing, which I think with the, these leaders that are the most extremist of the religious Zionists, the reli most of the religious Zionist people in this election didn't have anyone to vote for. Because as we heard, uh, Bennett's uh, party dissolved. Uh, they would not vote for Netanyahu because of his uh, corruption or alleged corruption. And they would not want to vote for Smotrich because of his extremism. Many of them did vote, end up voting for uh, religious Zionism. But for them, this is not really religious Zionism. Religious Zionism is much more pluralistic, much more uh, uh, moderate than the model that we have. But the tragedy is that today's leaders of the partners of the Likud are very, very extremist in their religious interpretation of what it means to be a Jewish state. Would either of you want to add to this? Yeah. I, I think that this isn't just an issue for Israelis. It, it's an issue for, for Jews everywhere to start. Right? There, there's a reason that we don't, we don't have a very good answer to um, what, what, is, what does it mean to be Jewish? What is Judaism? Is it an ethnicity? Is it a religion? Is it a culture? Is it a nationality? Is it a is it a peoplehood, which isn't really even a term, um, at least not a real one? Um, you know, it, it's it, it's it's all of these things, and it's none of these things. And depending on who you ask, you're going to get a very different answer. If we look at Israeli Jews writ large, they tend, and you know, if you if you look at the Pew study of Israeli Jews from a few years ago, they tend to effectively think of Judaism as an ethnic category, a tribal category, a, a national category. If you look at American Jews, they think of Judaism primarily as as something between a religion and a culture. Um, so, you know, we're going to have this divide within within Israel among Israeli Jews, and certainly between Israel and American Jews. Um, it's not going to go away. And you know, I think what we are seeing now is this. There's a there's a sense I think from political developments inside of Israel among many Israelis, or I should say, among many Israeli Jews, that somehow Judaism is under threat. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's similar to, uh, I think, a trend that we've seen in this country as well over the past half decade, where many white Americans will tell you that their identity is, is under threat, that the United States is in danger of no longer being the, the country that they, that they know, that they grew up in. Now, we can look at this from the outside and say, that seems that seems odd, um, you know, given that this is still a, a white majority and a, and a Christian majority country, um, and almost all positions of, of power tend to be held uh, and tend to be held by uh, by white Americans. Um, but that doesn't take away the sense that there are many white Americans who feel as if their identity and the country's identity is under threat. I think for many Israeli Jews. They saw an independent Arab party included in a coalition for the first time in Israel's history, and they absorbed messaging from Netanyahu and Likud and other folks on the right who kept on referring to the Bennett Lapid government because of Ra'am's inclusion as a Muslim Brotherhood government um, or a terrorist government or a government that was catering to, to non-Jews and it would sell out Israel's Jewish character. And I think for lots of people, even, even if I can certainly sit here from the outside and say, you know, that that seems that seems a stretch. I think that um, people felt that, and and this is why we're getting these questions now, you know, even more intently about what it means to be Jewish. Now, the the most radical party, or I should say, parties that are going to be in this coalition, uh, religious Zionism and Otsma Yehudit and Noam, are taking a very distinct view of what it means to be Jewish, which is a very halachic view. It's why you see them talking about gay pride parades, and it's why you see them talking about soccer on Shabbat, and it's why uh, just yesterday Ben Gvir is now talking about opening up the, revisiting the law of return, you know, and, and making it so that uh, if you have one Jewish grandparent, not only will you not be eligible for uh, conversion to be recognized halachically inside of Israel, you won't be eligible for the law of return either. Um, this is all taking a very halachic approach to Judaism, a very religious approach, a very obviously orthodox approach, um, and saying this is what it means to be Jewish. I don't think that a majority of Israelis buy into that, but given the fears over what it means now to be a Jewish country and what, what it means to have a Jewish identity, um, there is fertile ground to take the most extreme version of that and, and get it through, and I think that's, that's a lot of what we're seeing. Okay, Nasheen, did you want to add to that from your own perspective? 
To be honest, the state of Israel has been always Jewish for us, and it always will will always continue. Uh, it's democratic for for Jews and Jewish for Arabs, as uh, member Knesset uh, Knesset member um, Ahmad Tibi said before. And um, to be honest, we are not dealing enough with this question. Uh, two out of three children in the Arab society live under the poverty line. We have more than 50% of, of families live, live, live in poverty. Uh, we are about 20% of the population in Israel, but we don't have lands. There wasn't any Arab town that was established since 74 years. So we are dealing with much more basic, uh, uh, with basic needs that the state of Israel, although the revolution during during the uh, the last um, decade and a half, uh, we have a lot of government resolution and a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, budget economic uh, development that Netanyahu lead with the Ministry of Finance. But unfortunately, uh, on the macro level, maybe we can see changes. But in the micro level, in the individual level, people do not feel that that there there have been a, uh, um, a um, major change. So even if if even if we look well, when we, when we vote uh, for for the Knesset, we want our uh, our leadership to to deal with the occupation, to deal with our collective rights and unfortunately even uh, although netanyahu and the right try to uh, to paint our leader as a uh, as as leaders that only uh, deal with um, uh, with the occupation and with uh, with with the, um, 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 uh, collective rights 96% of their time were invested in economic issue but and i expect from the state of Israel to take to take care about public about public school about landing about those basic issues and unfortunately um, there we're not dealing enough with with um, with the character of uh, with the character of Israel and we are the most um, 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 minorities that influenced by the character of Israel because I I believe that. Although I know that you are a very secular people, but it will be always your country. You always will be a first class citizen. And today I'm not sure that uh, there is a first class that only, of course, all Jews belong to, to this first class uh, 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 group. And there is uh, the Druze that serve in the army. And we are a, a third class citizen. And unfortunately it's going, it's it's being much more it's being worse from year to year from day to day um i want to disagree because uh you know let's let's suppose the numbers were a bit different okay and uh, and the merits would have passed and it would have been 60 60 or 61 59 to the other side there was a real chance that Ayman Ode and Ahmed Tibi and the Mansour Abbas would have been ministers in the government. They wasn't. They, they weren't invited to uh, uh, to be to to to, to try to understand to to deal with uh, uh, with the, with the new government. Lapid did not invite Ayman Ode and Ahmed Tibi to be to take part in in, in, in conversation. So he is not. Uh, um, but you know, throughout the campaigns, Netanya um, Lapid was very adamant not to say that he will not sit with them, and it was clear that this was on the cards. And you know that from the discussion with the, from uh, with the Aymanode and the NTB. But but I think that it's also up to us because I think uh, you know it's not well. We know that, but I'm not sure you know that, that in 2014, when Amir Levy, the, the um, uh, CEO of the um, finance minister, came to Netanyahu, he said, you know what's going to be the next economic miracle? And, he, and Netanyahu said, where do I have to bring Jews to have the next uh, economic uh, uh, miracle? And Amir Levy said to him, you don't have to bring Jews. You have to make sure that the infrastructures of the Arab society in Israel are good enough so they can be part of the job market and the economy and all and all the rest that would follow. And uh, um, it took it, it took a year and it took uh, the incitement of Netanyahu against the Arabs in the in the election 
but then the government approved it, the 92 uh, uh, program that you know all too well, and it is already in the works. So I think that there is uh, a wide understanding of the majority of Israelis that in terms of infra infrastructures, the Arab society is part of Israel. And I, and I think that, yes, it is very unfortunate that we are having this government and that the incitement against the Arabs was so uh, so uh, uh, dreadful. And you saw the, the pictures before, but I think that in terms of the actual uh, situation on the ground, we are miles away from where we were even 10 years ago. So I think it's something that, that is shared by the majority of Israelis. Okay, so we have very different perspectives on this, uh, but that's very natural as well. Uh, I, want, I want to take, we only have uh, you know, less than 20 minutes left to open it up to questions from our audience and maybe kind of give uh, our students here uh, first uh, priority when it comes to the questions. Um, what's, oh, we got a microphone right here. So if you want to, my suggestion is anybody that wants to ask a question can simply line up uh, and to make this a more efficient process. Please. Thank you. And if you don't mind uh, introducing so yourself first. Yeah. yeah, I'm introducing myself. Hi, my name is Niklas Stöhler. I'm a graduate exchange student here at the School of International Service. And my question would be directed towards the last point you made. Um, and it's mainly about the drivers for people's voting decisions. So you were talking a lot about the secular religious divide and also about identity, which is a driver for people's voting decision. But I wanted to ask, I mean, you were talking also a lot about inequality and the, a lot of people are still below the poverty line whether the economy could be revived as a, politi as a politicized topic, which could then um, give some leverage to the political left of Israel. I'm thinking of Meretz or the Labour Party, uh, which would maybe could then gain some more vote shares and sort of flourish again in the elections. Thank you. I think the economy was a very low topic on this election. Um, neoliberalism is pretty much the guiding line. Maybe it's kind of a liberal, neoliberal, but it's always a mixture. Labour Party tried to create a more socialist agenda, but unsuccessfully. Regarding the Arab citizen, I'm, I want to tap onto what Gail and, and, and Nasreen said. I think that from Netanyahu's perspective, perspective, giving money to the Arab citizens in order to be part of the economy is a good idea, and it's depoliticizing them. I think the idea is we can accept you as individuals, who flourish economically, but not as political citizens. And I think it's a very important distinction he makes there. I want to disagree. I think that uh, the majority of Israelis uh, are social democratic by their uh, because they want and because they want uh, good education, public education, public health, public uh, um, uh, welfare, etc. Uh, and you see it across the board much more adamant than here in the states or uh, in uh, Europe. Um, and I think social democracy is not just about helping the poorest of the poor. It's about having good uh, social services for all the population. So I think yeah, even uh, Lapid and uh, uh, and Gantz and these people that show up as if they are neoliberals, they are, and especially Bennett, they all share the Republican idea uh, of rights and, uh, and uh, obligations. Obligations meaning that the state has obligations towards you because you go to the IDF and, uh, and pay taxes, which means in effect social democratic policies. So I think the majority of Israelis are pro-social democracy in terms of economics, uh, but, uh, but I think I agree that it was not on the cards. Uh, so, Okay, uh, with your permission, we're going to go on to the next question here. Um, unless somebody else wants to add, uh, I'm just going to go right along. Please introduce yourself. Hello, thank you so much for speaking here today. My name is Lila Wall, and I'm an undergraduate student here studying psychology and Jewish studies. Um, my question surrounds the, um, the tendency of radicalization towards the right that we've touched on a bit today. Um, a trend that's occurring in the United States and globally is social media being a tool of radicalization, both politically sides left and right. Um, and I'm curious of how that trend looks in Israel, if any at all. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, a couple of months ago, there was this uh, whistleblower for Facebook. Her name was Frances Haugen, and she spoke about the policies of Facebook and content moderation. One of the things that she actually said was that um, in countries with unique languages, the harm caused by social media is much stronger than in uh, countries that are English uh, centered uh, or Arabic for the, uh, for the sake or French or German. Um, and she gave as an example, uh, Myanmar and Ethiopia. But uh, as was mentioned before here today, Israel almost um, suffered from a civil war just uh, a, a year ago. And most of the incitement to violence as well as actual organization to um, uh, conduct actual violent uh, deeds was done on social media. Now, I don't know if you read about it, but what Elon Musk has done during the past couple of weeks to Twitter was first and foremost uh, to fire the trust and safety teams. That doubles the danger to societies like Israel. First of all, as I said, because of the content moderation issue and the problem that machines cannot actually um, conduct any kind of content moderation, automatic content moderation, but also because uh, Twitter is going to be filled with neo-Nazis. Um, and because of that, um, the Israeli society today, um, first of all, um, I think suffers from radicalization and polarization as we see in other democracies in the world, but also I would say is more exposed to their dangers than other, um, I would say more common language um, uh, society. Thank you. Thank you very much for helping us out with that answer. Uh, let's go well, on. Well, at least, uh, you know, you've been, I, I was asked about something that I, I know not only Jewish and democratic state. Wonderful. Thank you. Sophie? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sophie. I'm a political science major and then a CIS minor and intern. Uh, my question has to do with the occupation, which obviously has been going on for a very long time. And now with this new coalition, we're seeing a lot of members of what was once considered fringe groups now the very represented in the government and in the mainstream. Um, so I guess my question going forward is when we should start to shift our view of the occupation and when, if ever, we should start looking at the occupation as de facto annexation and rather than waiting for official annexation. I can, I can start with that one. Um, I think it's, I, I think you'd, you'd be forgiven for today, assuming that, um, that the occupation has in many ways become permanent. Um, I think that many of the measures that we describe as creeping annexation, um, that's, that's, that's an accurate term. Um, it's it's not impossible, but it's difficult to sit here and say that there's going to be political will on the part of the Israeli government at any point soon to to end the situation. I think that all you have to do is look at what the reaction was across the Jewish Israeli political spectrum to the release of the Trump plan in January 2020. The Trump plan uh, was revolutionary in in two ways. One was that it contemplated an upfront Israeli annexation of 30% of the West Bank before any negotiations, before anything else. Second, it took as a starting point the idea that no Israeli who lives in the West Bank today will ever have to get up and move. And so it came up with a map that that purported to allow um, all, now it's 470,000 Israelis who are living uh, in the West Bank over the Green Line, plus another 230,000 in East Jerusalem, uh, it allowed every single one of them to, to stay where they are. And that is the new starting point, not just for folks on the right, um, you know, Benny Gantz, who is also really someone on the right, but, you know, let's pretend for a minute that he's not. Um, you know, even Benny Gantz came out and said, oh, that, you know, this, this is the new starting point. Uh, no Israeli should ever have to leave. It's very difficult once you have said that and once that's been absorbed by the entire Israeli political spectrum to say this is a temporary thing that's going to end at any point. Um, I think that different people have have their red lines as to when it's kind of officially game over. Um, you know, I can 
sit here for an hour and tell you all the reasons why it's not game over yet. Um, but I think that there are very good arguments to say it's time to stop treating this as if it's a temporary occupation and start to think about what it means that this is effectively permanent and how that has to shift um, Israeli policy and the policy of the rest of the world. I think that the uh, counter argument is uh, that Lapid, nobody forced him to go to the UN and talk about the two-state solution. And this is exactly what he did. So I think um, I think the, the, the courage of Lapid as a centrist and not leftist uh, leader to say, there, if you want to be a Jewish and a democratic state, you have to go for the two-state solution uh, is, uh, is the only hope for that. I don't, I'm not sure what's, uh, whether, you know, what's going to happen with Abu Mazen and, and uh, in the future and what's going to happen in uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, that if you want both Jewish and democratic state, then having the occupation as an agreed reality um, is going to jeopardize both. Today, Palestinians living in the in the West Bank, the majority of them understand that if the occupation will continue, we need we will be we we will need it to talk about one state solution. The two state solution is is irrelevant for a lot of them, so they understand that okay, the occupation is there for more, for more than five decades, and okay, we can wait uh, one or two decades, and then it will be one state uh, for for Palestinians and for Jews, and then it won't, the state of Israel won't be really uh, um, uh, a Jewish, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish state. So people understand that um, there, is, there is a reason to be, to continue to be, uh, to accept the situation and the, the, the hard reality that they are living in. Thank you. We're going to try to get through these questions. And uh, why don't you come up, Ryan? And uh, Hello, I'm Ryan Deitch. I'm a senior uh, in SIS, a student of Professor Ziv. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today and for speaking with all of us. Uh, my question that I had prepared was more on the occupation. But I guess uh, since you've really spoken a lot to what I was going to ask, uh, I'll ask about uh, regarding this sort of uh, relationship that American Jews have uh, with Israel, uh, just really uh, in, in sort of given these, the situation that we have uh, today, the rise of a religious right, uh, the sort of more polarization going on in Israel and other democracies, uh, I've personally spent a lot of time working with uh, both Israelis and Palestinians uh, on a variety of issues. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, given that there, there are a lot of tensions that already exist uh, in this relationship going forward, given that in the most generalized sense, uh, American Jews are uh, center, center left, uh, is, Israeli Jews uh, follow more centers and uh, to the right wing. Uh, it, and again, generalization there, but just really uh, speaking to that sort of situation going forward, uh, venues for cooperation and and what you would say to say like the class today in responding to uh those sorts of tensions and mitigating them Ryan, maybe you want to take this one you spent time with uh american jewish audiences as well as israeli students i assume you all did but uh i think that it's, it's a big question i think there is a there are two there, there are two options one is a complete withdrawal and the development of two separate communities to go their own way, develop their own sense of Judaism. There's another, another option of cooperation of you know, American liberal Jews. If there's going to be a developing uh, a struggle in Israel over the meaning of Jewishness and of liberalism, this could be also a venue for cooperation. So I'm not sure where it goes, but I think the two options are on the table. I have different perspective on that. Last week, I've seen um, uh, the congr congratulations of the JFNA Congratulate, congratulating the new government and celebrating the Israeli democracy. And I, I, I was shocked by th there wasn't any critical or any sentence about minorities, about human rights, about the occupation. 
And I think that this can tell you the whole story. Yeah, there is a, there will be a conflict and it will be much, much harder in the future. But when we talk about Israel, I believe this is a Tzipor and Efesh and Jews in, Jews in the state and in that diaspora will always protect uh, 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 the Jewish state. Uh, so um, I, I was, I, I see that, I, I see I see the Jewish minority in the state as our partners because of what, I've, what I've said before. Uh, but unfortunately, we are seeing more and more um, um, yeah, with a with a new government and with a, with a, with, a, with the new agendas. Okay, um, I, I want to get through these questions. We're almost out of time, so keep your questions brief, and maybe the answer is also. Uh... Oh, that's a good idea. So why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question? Um, yeah, excuse me. Sorry. Um, my name is Jackson Mandel, and I'm a student in SIS here at AU, um, and I'm on the board of J Street U here on AU's campus. Um, and my question was for Professor Haj Yahya, um, which was, what has been the reaction in the Arab Palestinian society in Israel to this election? Is there uh, a sense that it's going to be more of the same, or is this something that's led to a more desire to get involved in politics, potentially higher voter turnout among the Arab Palestinian community? Um, or is it just there's, you know, sort of this expectation that not really much is going to change in terms of the struggles of the community? Thank you. We're just going to collect uh, one more question here and then okay. have Zach. Hi, my name is Zach Inbiner Barkley. I am a third year student in the School of International Service and an Israeli studies minor. Um, I'm currently the editor in chief of Student Israeli, which I run under the sponsorship of Professor Ziv. And my question goes along the lines uh, very similar to what I asked um, Aluf last night regarding the Abraham Accords. And I'd like to know from each and every one of you, or everyone uh, in terms of time, um, what implications do you guys believe uh, this new government will have in terms of approaching the Abraham Accords, whether it be strengthening our relations with um, our new partners in the Middle East or in the Gulf, um, in Morocco, um, just your future implications uh, and ideas. Thank you. And we can shorten that by predictions. Predictions. Uh, Abraham Accords going forward. But Nasreen, why don't you get started with the previous question? Um, although the... Israeli democracy gave up on us. We did not gave gave up on on our on the on the political game. Although we are not legitimate to sit around the decision making uh, table, we fifty four uh, percent of Arab minority in Israel uh, voted last election. Although there is, to be honest, there is no reason because we knew that. Uh, we won't have, we won't have the power to uh, uh, to deal with our challenges. For example, uh, the land issue was not taken care by the recent government, which is a very um, um, important issue for the Arab minority. Uh, when we talk about uh, civil rights and about um, about basic needs, they were not taken care by the recent government, and so. Um, what I want to say that although people go and vote to get power, to sit around the table, uh, we have been doing that for too many times with knowing that we will be part uh, of the opposition in Israel and we won't really be... Um, we won't be uh, able to, uh, to, to, to shape our life and realities. So I believe that if this will continue and we will be the, the, legi the, the legitimized uh, on the political um, uh, uh, game, uh, the boycott movement will be will be much more uh, powerful in the in the future and we will see uh, the uh, percentage of uh, um, of um, of taking part of the political game will be uh, decreased in the in the future. And uh, very quickly on the Abraham Accords, any any predictions here? What's next? I don't I don't think they're they're under any threat. Remember that um, the Abraham Accords came into being under under Netanyahu. Um, I think that 
I can certainly see a scenario um, surrounding Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, where perhaps Morocco, you know, downgrades its relations temporarily, but I don't think they're under threat. Um, the relationship that I think is most at risk actually is the Israel-Jordan relationship from this new government, not um, not any of the Abraham Accords relationships. I think that this, you want, you want to be at the last word. Oh. <laughs> I think that uh, this is one of Netanyahu's ideas to economize the conflict. So avoid dealing with the Palestinians. That's where the real conflict is, by the way, and make these economic relations with other countries. And it's a win-win for him. It's uh, looking like we're a pro-peace state. We pay no price for that peace. The question is, with this government, will the Arab states that are in touch with Israel be able to maintain it on their behalf? But from, the, from Israel's behalf, these agreements should go on forever. Um, the leaders of the states with which we have the Abraham Accords are not democratic leaders. They don't give it them about our democracy. And I think uh, they're interested in the relationship, but what will happen if there will be a third intifada, if there will be unrest uh, in the occupied territories, uh, then we might see uh, some, uh, some uh, changes. Um, the greatest uh, achievement of Netanyahu from his own perspective is pushing aside the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, we didn't talk about it in any of the cycles of the elections. And uh, that was, from his perspective, his big achievement. Uh, whether it's going to be uh, the same, whether you have uh, annexation from this or that uh, sort, uh, then I, I'm not sure this will be the case. Um, and I think that uh, that uh, it will also that the USA will have a lot of role to play uh, in the the way that uh, the Middle East uh, is actually uh, shaping up. And I think that it has also to do uh, with the way to connect it to the former question. Uh, I think we are going to see changes within the left and within the Arab parties within the left. Um, and I think that uh, we'll see the uh, anti-votes to go to what Nasrin said, um, forming one party, but I think uh, Hadash may well go into relationship with Meretz and establish a Jewish uh, Arab shared uh, uh, party um, that will reshape the left and the relations between uh, Arabs and uh, Israelis uh, in Israeli politics. Thank you, Gail. And I want to thank, just take a minute to thank all our panelists for very dynamic presentations. You've heard from uh, four really interesting uh, panelists. Uh, I think I heard maybe five or six different opinions, um, which is typical, right? Um, but I want to also thank uh, Professor Brenner and Laura Cutler again for organizing this wonderful uh, conference. Um, you know, three terrific panels, all focusing on in different areas of Israeli democracy and in challenges, clear, very clear challenges. And I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us and staying with us. Okay, thank you. And thank you to Guy Ziv, my, your colleague, and also the other moderators. Um, thank you all for participating, for asking great questions, especially your students. And, um, we have a, another session, which is only for students and all the speakers, hopefully uh, some of you can stay. Um, we will uh, meet in the adjacent room to on this side. Um, for everyone else, thank you so much for coming. And I know you'll all follow what happens next in Israel, but maybe you'll follow it now with some more profound knowledge. So thank you all.